Let's rewrite the ending to Game of Thrones. My broad thoughts about the last few episodes is that though they hit the right beats for the most part, the pacing was off and there wasn't sufficient setup for... <laughs> A lot of it. Kind of like the writers knew where they wanted the characters to end up and just did everything they possibly could to make sure they got them there, story be damned. There were good, even great moments. And there were less great moments. There's nothing in the world more powerful than a good story. And who has a better story? than Bran the Broken. The only restriction is that we will only be rewriting the last two episodes, as doing more than that, like the entirety of season eight, means talking in pretty broad strokes, which is a lot easier to do than writing the specifics of a good ending. And it doesn't run into the issue of unknowingly writing too much or too little for the six episodes that we have. I'm trying to work within what we were given to make this seem like it really could have been possible. And I want to be clear, I don't harbour any hate towards the writers. This is just a fun thought experiment for me, to give the series that I love a perhaps more satisfying ending that maintains consistent characterization, especially for Danny, ties up more character arcs, and gives a more thematically resonant ending. So with each character, when I get to the end of their story, I'll explain why I feel this is a better end for their character. So let's do this scene by scene. Also, did you know that I have a book coming out on May 30? Yeah, it's like so incredibly close now. Crazy, but true. It's called On Writing and World Building. And thank you to the hundreds of you who have bought it in just the last couple of weeks. Thank you so much. It's got parts on everything from how to write a first chapter to how to world build polytheistic religions, all based on my YouTube writing and world building series. And you can maybe win a free copy by joining up to my Patreon because one new patron will win each month. Links down below. Game of Thrones, Season 8, Episode 5, The Bells. The great war against the dead has been won, and the armies of the Dragon Queen, the North, and the Vale are moving south. Cersei has lined the walls of King's Landing with scorpions, and the citizens are crowding into the Red Keep for protection against the foreign invader and her savages. Jaime, the Hound, and Arya are each heading south, while Daenerys and Grey Worm have just watched their beloved Masande die before them. Scene 1, The Small Council Meeting. Winter has come to King's Landing and snow is falling. A small council discussion of Jon, Tyrion, Davos, Grey Worm, Royce and Varys gather to plan the attack. Wine is brought for Daenerys, but she asks an unsullied to drink it first, a growing paranoia of traitors in her midst. When she finds it's not poisoned, she takes it. Jon brings up the issue that his men are exhausted from the Great War and the many long weeks of marching, and Lord Royce notes that 700 Northmen have already abandoned the cause along the way. John fears that more will do the same before the battle. Feeling John is challenging her authority and the small council looking equally concerned, Daenerys doubles down on her position and points that traitors to their queen will be dealt with the same way Rob Stark dealt with Lord Rickard Karstark. She then affirms that the battle will be done quickly and then they can return home. Varys grows more troubled, but Tyrion hardens his resolve. Grey Worm mentions that Jaime was caught trying to pass unsullied lines in a hood, identified by his golden hand, suspecting he was going for his sister. We should use him to persuade Cersei to back down, says Grey Worm. Hoping to save him, Tyrion intervenes. No, Jaime and my sister are not as close as you might think anymore. He left her to fight for us. Tyrion then redirects the conversation to Drogon, that though powerful, he is still young and vulnerable to scorpion bolts. As such, he has had chest and neck armor prepared for him in the past few weeks. It may slow him down, but it will save him from Rhaegar's fate, he says. He then discusses strategy. King's Landing is based around three hills that have been turned into defensive fortifications by Cersei's forces. The Red Keep, Visenya's Hill, and Rhaenys Hill, armed with scorpions and the like, all of which would need to be taken for the city to fall. Varys notes that his little birds have said Cersei is up in the Red Keep, holding up with citizens, men, women, and children around her to protect her. Between Jon and Tyrion, they decide that their plan is to take the Hill of Rhaenys first, to set up a defensive position within the city, dismantling scorpions on the walls and on the hill to bring in Drogon. Tyrion also suggests bombarding them with ballistics throughout the night, forcing enemy troops to stay awake while allowing men to fight in shifts to give them rest, keep morale up, and keep them from abandoning as John worries. I think it's important that we need to see Tyrion's strategic and mindful intelligence that he seems to have lost a bit in the last while. Scene 2, Tyrion frees Jaime. Following much what we saw in the episode, Tyrion frees Jaime under a similar but not identical pretense. Stop the massacre, ring the bells, or do what you need to do, he says. 
knowing that only the deaths of Cersei or Daenerys would bring an easy end to the conflict, and that Jaime was the only one who could get close to her. Scene 3. John in the camp. John is walking about the camps when he meets a soldier, who says that he hasn't harvested his crops in runestone yet, that they might be gone, and that he just wants to go home. My son was born a year ago and I haven't even seen him yet. I've been fighting ever since for this lord, that lord, that queen. John learns that his name is Edwin Tullet of House Tullet, the same house of Dolores Ed, his Night's Watch friend who died in the long night. Scene 4. Jamie heads for King's Landing and actually makes it through the gates with the help of Lannister Guardsmen, who recognise his golden hand. At the same time, we see that the Hound and Arya have made it inside King's Landing and are now walking the streets. Jamie meets with Cersei and the two hug closely. He begs her to ring the bells and promises that Daenerys will be merciful, to which Cersei replies, no mother is merciful to those who harm her children. Realising that battle is inevitable, there's a shot of Jaime gripping a knife at his side, knowing full well that Cersei's death would mean a peaceful fall to the city, but he cannot bring himself to do it. Jaime kisses her and lets go of the knife, unable to overcome his most deeply rooted demon. The Queen's Guard then arrive with Kyburn and Euron. In the distance, the allied armies form up. Scene 5. The battle begins, and there's a couple of changes to the initial setup. Unlike in the show, the Golden Company are positioned behind the walls, and there's an emphasis on how the Lannister men are fresh and well supplied, while the Dothraki, Unsullied, Northmen and the Vale are spent from the march and battles before. There should be consequences to having to drag an entire army down south, especially during the beginning of winter, when food is already scarce. The battle begins at high noon. Now, the strategy that Danny uses against Euron's fleet in the show, flying out in front of the sun to catch an enemy by surprise, is actually a tactic used by dragon riders in the A Song of Ice and Fire lore, but it's only good for a one-off tactic. As such, she won't use it to destroy the Iron Fleet, which overall doesn't do that much for the fall of the city. Instead, she'll use it to shatter the walls of King's Landing. This scene is told from the perspective of one of the Lannister men manning the scorpions along the walls. The sun is high. A man looks up into the sky when he spots a flicker of a shadow, squinting before he realises the dragon is descending upon them. He yells for the scorpion to aim upward, but it's too late. Then he dives from the sky and blasts the gates of King's Landing open, making way for her armies. Drogon swoops up and away, his chest armour deflecting a single bolt from our Lannister man, while another sticks in his leg. Painful, but not fatal. Drogon glides to safety. The allied forces flood into King's Landing and begin to take the city street by street. Cersei refuses to surrender. It's a bitter and horrific fight as barricades are set up and women and children hide. At this point, the battle is seen from the perspective of Davos, credit to Reddit for this idea, who watches as the horrors of war unfold before him, though we only see the Golden Company and Lannister forces being overwhelmed at this point. Davos watches Grey Worm ruthlessly tear through Lannister men somewhat sadistically. And at the same time, our Lannister man that we spoke about before stumbles about the battlefield, sheltering women and children as the conflict rages around them. He escorts them to safety. As the battle moves into its first night, the forces of King's Landing fall back to barricades around the Hill of Rainies that prove difficult to breach. Davos watches John order a halt after a dozen men die trying to breach the barricade. The city will fall by dawn, he calls out. Lay down your arms and you will be allowed to pass. Grey Worm casts a dark glare towards Jon, reluctant to abide by such an order. At first, the men refuse. But after they hear a roar in the distance from Drogon, the Gold Cloak, Ironborn and Lannister forces in the area drop their weapons one by one. Davos watches as they are escorted from the battlefield to outside the city. The focus shifts back to Daenerys. She has removed the bolt from Drogon's leg, who is now limping. When Tyrion arrives and announces that a number of Lannister soldiers have surrendered, at that, she takes a bloodied hand from Drogon's wound, staring at the crimson running down her arm for a second. She climbs atop her dragon and then goes to meet them, a hundred unarmed, terrified men. Varys and Lord Royce emerge to watch from afar. Tyrion begins, I thought that they should see their queen before returning to their homes. It has been a long war and not just for us. Danny looks at her bloodied hand and mutters, Fire and blood. They have drawn blood and I will give them fire. Tyrion begins to protest before she says they will return home. Half of them. Unsullied, she commands, My queen, these are defeated men. 
much akin to what we see in episode 6. They are free men, she says. They chose to fight for Cersei, and soldiers will fight a war again unless they see its fires. Masande, Rhaegal, my children, their blood is on their hands just as much as Cersei's. They fought for their home, Tyrion says. They laid down their arms for it too. But Danny passes him aside astride Drogon. Drakaris. Fifty of the unarmed soldiers, men, boys, and grandfathers alike, are burned alive while the other fifty watch. Return to your homes, she says. Harvest your crops and tell your people that the tyrant Cersei Lannister will be defeated. The battle resumes in the streets of King's Landing. Jon receives a messenger from Varys explaining what Danny has done. What is it, my lord? A Stark Bannerman asks. Nothing. Drogon was wounded and the Queen found her justice. Bring the next shift of men on and relieve those others. Tyrion's strategy, it seems to be, is working, and we see a shot of Unsullied fighting along the battlements, destroying scorpions one by one. This change is important because there is a massive jump between crucifying the cruel masters and committing genocide. Killing enemy soldiers or making an example of your enemies is a lot more morally grey and even understandable. These are the soldiers who manned the ships that killed Rhaegal, the walls where Masande died. Scene 7. We return to the Red Keep, which has closed its gates with the Hound and Arya inside, alongside thousands of civilians hoping to shelter from the battle. King's Landing is smoking. Many of its buildings have collapsed. Cersei and Jaime look out upon the destruction. Kyburn then walks in and asks to speak to his queen privately, and Jaime watches her suspiciously as she leaves with him. My queen, says Kyburn, they have taken the Street of the Sisters and the Hill of Rainies. I fear that they should be at the gates of the Red Keep by dawn. If you deem it time, we should use our final defense. Not yet, she replies. At the same time, Euron joins Jaime. Uh, what brings a man like you back here, Jaime Lannister? You were on the winning side down there. I could give you a death sentence right now if that's what you're after. <laughs> Why are you here? You've got your ships, and the gods might be twisted, but they wouldn't put something like you on the Iron Throne. Oh, you'd be surprised by how godly I am. You've served seven gods, but I've served ten thousand. When men see my sails, they pray. I've killed kings, and I've sat their thrones before. Hmm. All of them feel the same, though. Though that one might be a little bit more prickly. You know, if we lose tonight, then I'll just give them Cersei and leave. Find somewhere else. Someone else. Might take you with me, tongue or no tongue. They say the blood of a king is valuable. Imagine the blood of a kingslayer. Scene 8. Varys and Tyrion stand together watching the battle from afar. You saw what she did, says Varys. I know, says Tyrion. I warned you. I know. I worry for her. I worry for us all. Traitors will die the death of Rickard Karstark. <laughs> Karstark's execution also marked a trail of blood to the Red Wedding. She should not have burned those men, but my father did worse and people called him the greatest statesman to have ever lived. Do you wish your queen to be Tywin? Of course not. I killed the last Tywin. I fear she will do more and worse. Fire and blood is a promise more than a threat. We must speak with her. Yes. Let me speak with her, and know this, friend. I do this for you as much as for the people. Do what? Vera smiles. Scene 9. The battle continues and the streets run with blood. This scene is told from the perspective of our Lannister man from before, as well as Davos. The Lannister soldier parries a northerner before a charge of Dothraki screamers ride in, slaughtering soldiers first, and to his horror, the stories were true. They killed and raped civilians as well. Akin to the scene where Jon stops a Northman raping a woman in King's Landing, the Lannister man steps in to do the same when another Northman runs into a civilian home, and he can see the Dothraki doing the same. He runs the Northerner through with a blade to save that one girl, but he cannot save them all. He escorts her further behind the Golden Company barricades on Vicenius Hill, one of the largest strongholds in the city still standing. This scene is important because the Dothraki are known for their brutality like this, and the show's never really explored it. Daenerys has never really had to account for the fact that the Dothraki have these kind of war customs. Having a scene like this very much shows the sort of flaws in her ruling vision. Dothraki war customs are the sort of things that she wouldn't account for, that she wouldn't really deal with like a ruler should. It also lets us root for the Lannister side here, seeing how they are the foreign invaders, blurring that line between what has until this point been very much a good versus evil fight. We return to Danny, who is saddling up Drogon to ride out again. 
Dogo Nuto has taken the Hill of Rainies, my queen, says Ferris, arriving carrying a jug of wine and a plate of bread. Please, my queen, have some bread and wine. It will be a long night, and I know you have not eaten or drunk. He pours her a glass as well as one for himself. Wine dulls my senses, she says. A little will only ease the nerves, he assures her. Daenerys looks at the glass uneasily before Varys himself takes a drink of it, proving it isn't poisoned. Traitors are many, my queen, but I am not one. Daenerys smiles and takes the goblet, putting it to her lips to drink. A moment passes before Varys swallows uneasily and his throat begins to constrict. Daenerys had only pretended to drink, suspecting him. Traitors are many, as many as I expected. John, you. She casts a side glance at Tyrion, and Varys collapses to the floor, the poison taking its toll as Danny climbs atop Drogon. He died a traitor's death. You freed your brother. I did. <laughs> she looks to the sky. I will deal with you when I sit on the Iron Throne. As she flies away, Tyrion kneels down. Oh, Varys, my friend. Part 10. The forces of the Dothraki, the Unsullied, and the Northmen push closer to the Red Keep. Victory feels close and dawn is breaking. The blood of the sun spreading across the horizon. The reds like the sky is set afire. Danny scorches a number of Cersei's battalions that still man the walls. And we watch as our Lannister man from before survives a cascade of fire overhead. Breaking the barricade they had built to protect the civilians. Allowing the Unsullied and Dothraki to surge forward. She is a foreign, fiery, horrific invader to him and she doesn't see how terrifying she is to the women and children of the city. We return to the Red Keep, where Jamie and Cersei watch in silence. They're so far away from the battle that you can't even hear the cries of pain and terror, the clang of sword on shield. I'll protect you, you know. I'll protect our baby. There's a passage through the dungeons down below. We can... we can leave. I can't leave, she says. Not now. Kyburn then arrives, a grave look on his face. My queen. They have taken much of the city. How many men do we have behind the walls, Kyburn? Two thousand Lannister loyals, your grace. Shall we send the signal? What signal? Jamie asks. If this dragon queen wants the city to burn, then let it burn. Cersei, what have you done? John and Grey Worm are amidst the chaotic fighting when an explosion sounds nearby and a great tower collapses as green light and screams fill the sky. We see in the episode that Cersei has stalked wildfire around the city in much the same fashion as the Mad King did once before when Robert's Rebellion was at his gates. One by one, these wildfire canisters go off, lay deep beneath the buildings of King's Landing, in the sewers, atop Visenya's Hill, the Hill of Rainies, and more. John watches in horror as the streets erupt in imperishable flame, buildings collapsing on women, children, Lannister, Stark, and Unsullied alike. The canisters were strategically laid at points that she knew they would try to take, and the Allied forces begin to dwindle. All formation is lost as men throw themselves to the ground, burning. Danny too watches in horror as the last of her Unsullied begin to burn alive, as the Dothraki horses reel in terror of the uncontrollable green flames, her own dragon fire only fueling the inferno. It's in this moment that we get the running through the city chaos that we saw in the episode from Arya. Though credit to Reddit for this idea, we will be seeing it from the perspective of Davos, as well as our Lannister man. Switching between their perspectives, they are dodging falling buildings and wildfire bursts. At some point, Davos and the Lannister man meet, but instead of fighting, they work together to save a family from the fires. Afterwards, Davos finds the young girl with the wooden horse, imagery that calls back to his relationship with Shireen. He tries to pull her away from her mother's body, but he cannot. She is caught in a wildfire blast, and heartbroken at the sight, Davos breaks down in tears. In the midst of the crumbling city, the camera slows and Davos imagines his son, Mathos Seaworth, who died in the wildfire explosion of season 2 during the Battle of Blackwater, and he is transfixed. Davos is killed by the surrounding falling debris. For a man who says he's not cut out for war, he certainly survives a lot of it. Seeing another child killed in a wildfire explosion would be incredibly hard for him to watch, after Shireen burned at the stake and his own son killed by the same thing those years ago. With this, he would be done. A moving and tragic end to his story. Part 11. When the fires finally begin to die down, only a small number of the allied forces remain. But Cersei's forces behind the walls of the Red Keep are wholly unharmed and fresh. Two thousand fresh soldiers march out into the streets to meet the remaining Northmen. Jon rallies his men, as does Grey Worm of the last few Unsullied. Daenerys lands atop a building and Drogon roars, furious and heartbroken at the loss of innocent lives around her. 
the burned bodies of children that she had seen before. My blood riders, will you take this last ride with me? The remaining Dothraki cheer. Form up, she orders, and the Unsullied do, but the Northmen do not. They are tired, and they have seen the last of their men, their brothers, their fathers, their houses killed. In the wake of this turn of events, they are done. John sees this in his men's eyes, and he looks to Edwin Tolliot, who he had spoken to that day before. The battle is lost, Lord Snow, says one. Let the lions have their seat of swords, said another. Winter has come, and my family needs me, says Edwin. John nods, swallowing, but Danny speaks to them. Men of the North, as your queen, form up and raise your blades to those who would oppress you. To that she gets no response as a dozen of the men turn their backs to her and begin walking for the walls, abandoning the siege for their homes and families. Danny sees that her chances are slipping. Men of the North, she presses, do not make me give you a deserter's death. At that, John steps forward. Danny, do not do this. This is the last war and we need to fight it. Today is lost. More men are coming and they will not survive. Let them go. The Northmen continue walking, before a fury grips the Dragon Queen. After the betrayals of John Varys Tyrion and now the abandonment of her forces, she launches into the sky and burns the Northmen alive as they try to leave as deserters. Among them is Edwin Tolliot. John watches, horrified, and he slowly realises that he made the wrong decision all along. As with Egret, love was the death of duty, and his duty was to the North. Daenerys lands Drogon in the street, blocking their way out of the city. The remaining Northmen fearfully turn towards the battle ahead of them, but Jon does not. Daenerys, the battle is lost. You must know this. It is not over so long as Cersei is alive. Grimacing, Jon puts his sword away. Northmen, sheathe your swords. We are returning home. To your crops, your daughters, your sons, and winter does not wait. And what of your duty to your queen? Fight till the skies are washed with flame and the halls of the Red Keep are painted with blood. Or come with me. My duty is to the north, always should have been. He begins to walk down the street, Northern is slowly walking behind him. Drogon growls as Jon passes, before Danny intervenes and calls him off. The two share one long, hard and distant stare before he leaves the city. With the Northmen gone, she clambers atop Drogon once more, a fiery anger in her alight more than ever. Grey Worm urges her to move, that her time is now, that she must burn the Red Keep and take the throne or would be forever lost. Drogon then takes to the sky, a dark silhouette against the harsh morning light. Dodging a barrage of scorpion bolts, one deflecting off Drogon's chest armor, she unleashes a torrent of fire to obliterate a line of scorpions along the walls, burning the rest of them as they attempt to reload. The battle between the remaining Unsullied, Dothraki, and the Lannister men ensues with Cersei's forces taking the upper hand, eventually working to surround the remainers. Cersei, Kyburn, the Mountain, and Jaime head for the safety of Maegor's Holdfast when they see her approaching. In the windows, and the halls on the battlements, and in the baileys, Daenerys can now see men, women, and children, highborn and lowborn alike, all who thought that the Red Keep would keep them safe. All she needs to do to take the throne is to burn the Red Keep to the ground, fire and blood. Cersei had already killed so many with wildfire. She had taken Masande, Rhaegal, her children, her unsullied from her. Cersei was the monster. Surely, even if some people were lost in the dawn of this new peaceful age, that would not make her her mad father, the mad king, right? It would only be the necessary force and fire and blood to free those under Cersei's thumb. But in the instant before Daenerys utters the word to bring the Red Keep and thousands of people to ashes, she stops herself. This is not who she is. The innocents come first. She stayed in Essos for years to help slaves, she rejected offers of gold and ships to guard the vulnerable, and she gave up so much of her army to protect them all. This was not her. She would not be the Mad Queen, and she now knew that that meant leaving behind the Iron Throne today. Now I want to be clear, while I do think that the Mad Queen route will be the right thing for the books when Martin gets to it, the show did not sufficiently set up that character change. 
so she needs to end up in a different place that is more consistent with her overall characterization. She could maybe justify burning unarmed soldiers or traitors, but definitely not unarmed civilians and children especially. The overarching theme of Daenerys' story is that the moral leader is not necessarily the best one something that we often see in other fantasy stories like with Aragorn. Though Dany may have freed the slaves and defended the weak, virtually every city she has ever ruled, especially in the books, has ended up worse off than before her supposed liberation through corruption, insurgency, starvation, and disease. The greatest challenge of her story is that she has found that being a good leader means compromising her moral character, and faced with this ultimate test, it's more consistent with her character in the show and more meaningful to her arc for her to end in keeping her morality by giving up the throne and proving she is not her father as people feared. This also gives more meaning to her vision from season 2. She doesn't just never reach the Iron Throne, she chooses to turn away from it. Then distracted in this moment, a scorpion bolt suddenly tears through Drogon's wing at the shoulder. He screeches in pain and the two begin to fall. Our view switches to the Lannister man we have followed throughout this battle, who is manning the last scorpion not destroyed on the battlements, attempting to save his home from the Queen of Fire and Blood. Drogon haphazardly falls and flutters down, crashing in amongst the last Unsullied and Dothraki as the Lannisters close in. Daenerys tries to stop the blood, but the wound is broken bone and vein and the blood flows freely. Better supplied, better prepared, and with overwhelming numbers, the Lannister men slaughter the last of the Dothraki and Unsullied, who stand their ground protecting the Dragon Queen. Drogon's eyes slowly close as he becomes too weak to move. Broken in every way and having lost everything, Dany chooses to die among those who have been there since the start of her journey, the Dothraki and those who have faithfully served her, the Unsullied. Grey Worm dies defending his queen to his last breath, and Dany is killed by a mob of furious and fearful Lannister soldiers. In a beautiful moment of symmetry, it's in a parallel shot to that of the Mesa scene, except this time she is being overwhelmed instead of being raised up. This ending for Daenerys is bittersweet. She proves that she is not her father and she maintains her moral character, but at the cost of losing the throne and then her life, reflecting her flaws as a leader which we have seen throughout the series as well as the strengths of her character, her mercy and love for the vulnerable. In line with the fates of Ned, Rob and Tywin, here Daenerys is defeated by the weakness that lies in the shadow of her strength. This also really humanizes the Lannister side here. It's understandable why our Lannister man would shoot her down. And as Daenerys' eyes glaze over, episode 5 closes. Part 2 of this covering the final episode will be coming out tomorrow. It does continue on from this episode, and I actually think it's got some of the coolest scenes in the rewrite, so wait out for that. But if you want to help support the channel, support me, support Supreme Leader Mishka, my beautiful kitty cat who I love with all of my heart, then links to my book and my Patreon are down below. If you get it, thank you so much. Thank you to like the, the 1300 of you who have already bought it. It's um... That, that's so many more than I, I thought, it's just incredible, thank you so much, and to my patrons, as always, you guys mean the world to me, you keep me afloat, you keep me going, you're awesome. Stay nerdy, and I'll see you in the future.